Terrific. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I hope everyone is staying healthy. Today, we are launching a series of conversations with Northeastern law graduates who are doing really interesting work during this pandemic and potentially beyond. Our first guest is Barbara Pollock, class of 82, a graduate who has recently curated a wonderful virtual art show. First, um, welcome Barbara. And I'm gonna share a bit about Barbara's background that I think you'll all find interesting. And then I'm going to ask Barbara a series of questions. Barbara, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a real thrill. I'm happy to have you and reconnect with you. Yes. So Barbara, Barbara, as I mentioned, is an 82 graduate of Northeastern University School of Law. She went to Brandeis for undergrad and followed law school with continuing education at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. She's been writing about art since 1994, often addressing the situation for artists in repressive regimes from a global perspective and particularly China. She's the author of many essays and books, including most recently, Brand New Art from China, A Gen Generation on the Rise, which was published in 2018. Her first book was The Wild Wild East, I love that name, An American Art Critic's Adventures in China, which was published in 2010 by Time Zone Books. She's a leading authority on Chinese contemporary art and has been featured, a featured speaker at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting of new champions in China, also known as Summer Davos. She has written extensively on contemporary Chinese art in publications such as The Village Voice, Vanity Fair, and The New York Times. She's currently co-curating an online exhibition called How Can We Think of Art at a Time Like This as a platform for the exchange of ideas at this time of crisis. Her partner in this effort is Anne Verhollen. This show has been written up in The New York Times and The New Yorker. She has regularly curated art shows, starting with a 96 show staged in her home titled My Friends in My Apartment and a one day exhibition in 2001 at a local schoolyard called Yard Sale with the cooperation of Simon Watson. In recent years, she's curated shows at the Tampa Museum of Art, the Orange County Museum of Art, the Long Museum West Bund in Shanghai and the Used Museum also in Shanghai. Based on her research in this field, Barbara has received two grants from the Asian Cultural Council in 2008 and 2016, and the prestigious Creative Capital Warhol Foundation Art Writers Grant in 2008. Barbara is also an adjunct professor at the School of Visual Arts in New York City and frequently lectures on contemporary art at universities and museums throughout the United States and Asia. In 2022, she'll present Mirror Image, Changing Chinese Identity at the Asia Society Museum in New York. That is Barbara's background and it's really robust and interesting, Barbara. My first question is coming up. Barbara, tell me exactly where you live and how you are handling this strange and uncertain time. I live in the West Village in Manhattan in New York City. And uh, normally I have a life that's really packed with events that I go to, but um, sure. now I'm home going to events often daily through Zoom rooms. And um, I'm, I'm adjusting to it. But also I and Anne are very, very busy with this website we've launched. How can we think of art at a time like this? We start our days at eight in the morning to get the new artist up for the day and post our newsletter and Instagram account and then the rest of the day is spent planning the next day, being in touch with artists all over the world and um, responding to people who want us to speak or want to write about us or whatever. So it's a really full day. And usually at about 10 o'clock at night, Anne and, our, Anne and I are on the phone just telling each other that we're geniuses. <laughs> I love that. We should all be telling ourselves that right now. We're geniuses. Well, I always say that we often define geniuses as people who make it into the canon or are shown at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But my definition of genius is someone who survives as a creative person over the course of decades before getting recognition. So we have a lot of those kind of artists on the site. Fantastic. 
Now I'm gonna take a step back in time and ask you about law school. Why did you choose to go to law school at Northeastern and what drew you to our school in particular? Okay, I went to law school because my mother insisted that I get a law degree. <laughs> and she was very adamant about this. And she did not want me to be an artist. She did not want me to be somebody in the art world. I mean, this was 40 years ago and middle-class parents were much more bourgeois about these things. And, but I picked Northeastern because I figured if I was going to go to a law school, I needed to go to someplace that would allow me to be as creative as possible. Mm. And, um, in fact, many of the professors back in the late 70s, early 80s, had made decisions to do really creative things with their practice and in their understanding of the law. And so I found it incredibly intellectually engaging, um, even though I was miserable. <laughs> you were, were a, a square peg in a round hole, perhaps. Well, there were a lot of square pegs at Northeastern, so I wasn't alone. You Probably if I had were. gone to another law school, I would have recognized my mistake earlier and wouldn't have completed law school. But Northeastern completely encouraged students to follow their own path. So I was Don't very do. happy with that. Well, that leads me um, perfectly to my next question, which was, what were some of your favorite classes while you were at Northeastern? And do you have a favorite professor and why? Well, I have to admit, I have a soft spot for Mike Meltzner's uh, constitutional law class, which was wow. a lot of fun. And I also learned a lot from Carl Clare. Mm -hmm. Was that still his? there? Still here. He's still there? Labor. I learned enormous amount because he was all about deconstructing the law, which was, a, to me, an incredibly engaging way of looking at things. And in fact, I use a lot of lessons from that notion of deconstructing law to apply to how to deconstruct and decolonize art history or how to have a global approach to things that often we only think about American art. I've had a career thinking about art from lots of non-Western centers. And I think it goes back to that notion of deconstructing a canon that I learned in Carl Clare's class. Wonderful. Were you artsy as a child? Yes, I was enormously artsy. And I spent an enormous time um, while I was in Boston for those eight years going to um, not the museum so much, but there was a lot of performance art events and art taking place in people's apartments and alternative spaces. And I, I felt myself very much part of that scene. That's great. And um, what drew you to China and Chinese art? Okay. In the 90s, there was something called multiculturalism, which was a new way of looking at art, looking at art from centers, not in the United States and Europe, but to see developing art centers throughout Africa and Asia. And I was writing for the Village Voice about a series of artists who were showing in New York from those kinds of places. And in fact, a lot of the leading Chinese artists had left China after Tiananmen and were in New York. So I was the first person to interview people like Ai Weiwei or um, Sai Kuo Chang or um, Zhang Wan. And then in 2003, I was in Tokyo and this woman comes running at me and says, are you Barbara Pollock? Well, I have to tell you something. You cannot write about Chinese artists from New York. You have to come to China. And she set up my whole first trip for me and That's introduced fantastic. me to everybody. Wow. Um, but she really made me realize that I was going to have to get on planes and travel 15 hours to find out what was really going on in the world. Um, and since then, I've been an avid traveler, which that's uh, been all canceled this year. Yeah, definitely restrictive travel. 
Yeah. Um, I thought maybe you wanted to learn about contracts at law school and um, it was the side for artists on contracts. So that was kind of my guess, but um, it turns out it was your mother. Yes. I had no intention of practicing art law. Yeah. Art, whether it was art law or it was criminal law, I had to wear a suit and that did not suit me. So I soon found myself quitting the practice of law after a couple of years. Um, what kind of law did you practice for those? I was at Legal Aid Criminal Appeals for two years in New York City. In New York, you went right back to New York. That's great. Yeah, I went back to New York. Oh, um, I have to say the best part of Northeastern is I met my husband on a co-op. You did? In my sophomore year, and my second year. And so he drew me back to New York City. And what was his co-op? Or you're, well, you're both on the same co-op. What? Were you both on the same co-op? No, he was a, a, a lawyer arguing Supreme Court cases at the Legal Defense Fund. And that was a fabulous co-op. That was really wonderful. Is he still practicing law? Yes, he is. He yeah. has a practice um, dealing with police brutality. Fantastic. Um, I know that you have chosen a non-traditional route. Would you describe yourself primarily as a writer, an art show producer, an art critic, a curator, or a little bit of everything? Well, one is in the art world, if you want to be an independent person not working in an institution, you have to wear multiple hats to make a living. So... I have done a number of things as projects have come my way. I've been very lucky. Really interesting projects have been offered to me over the course of the last 30 years. And I've been very lucky to be in the right place at the right time on numerous occasions. Um, it's very typical for somebody who's an art critic to also be a curator. That's, you have to do a lot of writing as a curator and you have to, in a certain way, curate shows when you write articles on art. They're like little two-dimensional shows of um, artists you would associate with each other, trends you're seeing. Sure. Um, so the two hats are actually one hat. And you do a lot of writing as well. Oh, I do an enormous amount of writing. Um, in fact, uh, through the 90s and early 2000s, all I did was write. Um, okay, wow. And then later, people began offering me opportunities to curate shows. So I was really, you know, I was really, really lucky. Well, there's a lot of writing in law school. So you probably honed that talent or already brought that to law school. Um, those well, I had some over. talent in that area, but what law school taught me was to make a deadline, That's which good. has right? led for me to be quite successful writing for numerous magazines and publishers because I'm not the person who procrastinates. Right, good. Um, art can be cathartic and uh, cathartic even has the word art in it. Tell me about your current passion project and virtual show and how it came to be. Okay. In January, back in January, I had numerous projects lined up for this year, taking place either in China or with Chinese artists in New York. And when the Wuhan outbreak occurred, all of my projects are canceled. And I really understood the cancellation blues that a lot of people are experiencing now in the United States. It was very hard for me and it was very hard for all the artists I was working with. It was a lot of disappointment. So instead, I spent the months of January and February writing grant proposals for a book I intend to do called How Can We Think of Art at a Time Like This? Looking at artists in countries with rising authoritarianism at the moment. Then on March 14th, my friend Andra Holland came to me and said, all the museums closed today, we should do a website. This was before anybody launched a website. Yep. And she said, what should we call it? And I said, we should call it, how can we think of art at a time like this and concentrate on artists going through this crisis. And in three days, 
on a budget of less than $1,000, we launched the site yeah. and immediately got worldwide attention. Now, what's great for me is that I can call on my network of artists that I've developed over the last 40 years to participate. Right. And the outpouring of the response from artists has been amazing. We've got in Ai Weiwei, we've got in art stars like Marilyn Minter and Nicolene Thomas, but we've also got in artists who are just getting attention um, from China, from Japan, from Indonesia. Um, and we recently have really succeeded in our outreach to Africa, uh, to Johannesburg and Cape Town and Lagos. So we're going to have a truly international roster really soon. Do you I switch am, it up every day? We, we put a new artist up each day. So we now have over 30 artists up. But we have enough artists lined up for the next long period of time. And more artists are approaching us every day. We are not an open call. This is very important. We are a curated show. So Anne and I discuss the artists every evening and figure out carefully who we're adding to the site. So the site conveys a coherent message, even though there's a diverse group of artists. That's great. And it's the perfect title and it fits your book. And there's a lot of tie-ins. Tell me, I have another couple questions for you. Where do you know Anne from originally? Oh, Anne is somebody who I met through friends. She's 32 years old. She's gorgeous and brilliant. And we've been going around to art openings together for the last couple of years. Okay. And Anne has a job that's particularly suited to the website we're doing because she works as an artist agent in an agency that does things like deals between artists and Louis Vuitton or Robert Wilson and a global project, like things that galleries are not equipped to do, they do. So she knows a lot about how to create a website and how to do the Instagram account. And she knows many successful artists, but she also really knows um, how to make this site sustainable, which is our goal now. Whereas I've been in the nonprofit world for so long that um, I, I just don't think in those ways. And she's really great at reaching out for that kind of sponsorship and- um, Wonderful, it sounds like a great like partnership. A, now do you have- partnership. Do you have friends in China and Chinese artist friends? And can you tell us how they're doing? Um, yes, I've been in touch with China every day um, since December. The sweetest thing, an artist that we're going to present that I've worked with on projects is Sun Shen. And he just sent me a package of masks from China because he was worried about how we were doing in New York. And wow. no one I know in China got sick. Wow, And good. that was very lucky. They have been quarantined for many months now. Things are just beginning to open up in Shanghai where there were low cases of coronavirus, but in Beijing and in Hong Kong, things are still in lockdown. So I, I tell New Yorkers who are complaining after a few weeks of the virus Quarantine. that we might have to get used to this for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that you have such close ties to China and uh, a lot of your work has um, featured Chinese artists and been actually in Asia because this is a time when our two countries are tied together so closely and we're going through what they went through maybe a couple uh, months prior to us. So it is a, a really challenging time. But also I've been studying artists being censored and um, meeting obstacles under Xi Jinping, but yeah. now with Donald Trump as president here, if I'm allowed to say this, it's a Northeastern audience, I guess I got. Um, the idea of living in an authoritarian kind of state is not that foreign to us in the United States anymore. We used to think, oh, that happens in China, but a lot of cutback on civil rights is going on in the United States. 
while most of us are watching what's going on with the coronavirus. So um, the two countries are not so dissimilar anymore. Is there any, are there any other art shows that you think we should check out virtually during this time to keep ourselves um, just um, entertained a little bit and also to be a little bit thought provoking? Well, Besides your wonderful show. That's true. Museums are just beginning to stage shows. So it's um, <clears throat> very important to support your local museums like ICA Boston um, or the MFA um, by visiting their web websites because they need to know that they have viewership even while they're struggling doing this. In New York, the new museum has always had a digital platform and is doing great programming as, and other museums like the Met are just catching up. Also, there's two galleries that have launched really interesting programs, David Werner Gallery and Pace Gallery. But there you would find mostly very famous artists and how they're responding to the virus rather than a mixture. Terrific. So, um, but there's a lot to go see. I mean, now everybody's going online, but what we emphasize is we are totally non-commercial space. We are not presenting art as transactional objects where the interaction is supposed to lead to sales. We have created a completely safe, free exchange of ideas sort of space where you get to see art as a source of comfort, as a source of new ideas, as a source of inspiration, not as a source of reaching into your pocketbook. And that's a completely different kind of dialogue. Yeah, it is comforting and it is um, fun to go on some of these virtual tours right now. You have a book that's still coming up um, and hopefully the art show coming up in, was it 2022? That's um, happening. Is there anything else that's coming up for you that we should hear about? Right now, if you ask that question to anybody in the art world, that is a really bad question. Okay. You know, right. That is a, a really bad question because things are canceled right now. And people are talking, like the Asia Society has a triennial that was supposed to open in June that they've moved to the end of October. So nobody really knows how long this is gonna go on and what time to start scheduling live three-dimensional art shows again, so. We might see a lot of virtual art shows and a lot of more uh, digital type of creativity going on in the next six months. Yeah, Maybe. definitely there's gonna be a lot of that. And I don't think the art world is ever going to be a place again where online exhibitions is second place. I think, right. I think a lot of people are going to be thinking about how to have a digital presence from now on. Sure, a complimentary one, if not a, um, the only one currently. Is there anything else we should know about Barbara Pollock, class of 82? You should know that I've experienced my life as a great adventure. I mean- Sounds like it. I, I have endless curiosity and I'm always seeking out where the excitement is. So I've been very lucky that for 40 years, I've gone from one interesting situation and project to another. And um, that's what I wish for everybody who goes to Northeastern Law School. Uh, I was very lucky that I was not interested in corporate law and that I've been able to take this alternative route. And if people want to know more, please get in touch with me. I'll tell them how if they have questions. Well, Barbara, that's our interview today, our conversation. I'm so glad that you could spend time with us and we could share a little bit about what you're doing and this wonderful art show that's going on currently. I appreciate your time and learning more about you. Yes, please everyone go to www.artatatimelikethis.com and see what we've posted today. Wonderful. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Nice to talk to you today. Thank Take you. Care. It was an honor. Thank you.